selling something does not necessarily mean cold calling, knocking on a door, going up to someone's office and saying, Hey, I think you should do, you know, I want to take over PT. You should do this. Like you need to come at it from the why, like, what is the pain point you're trying to solve? Is it that running PT or, or having human performance is just an added duty for this individual? And you think that you could kind of take that, that pain away from them, whether they realize it or not. Um, you know, all those types of questions, that's the sales piece of it. So I think to your point, like people engage in sales a lot more than they probably recognize. And in the human performance space, because we are inundated with so many free resources, good, bad, or otherwise, like you have to show them the why you can't just assume that if you build it, they will come because that will not happen. Yeah, we did one. This has nothing to do with like getting towards the topic of the podcast. We did one like the last summer before senior year, like long range land nav, where we went to like, I think it was like a national park or a state forest or something like that. Um, but since it wasn't like a military piece of land, there weren't like pre-positioned land nav points out there. So, so they used second lieutenants as the land nav points. Huh. Just like they just like put these guys out there with like lawn chairs and radios, and it was pouring rain. So these fucking guys were just like <laughs> just sitting there in the middle of the woods. Hey, you're a land nav point. <laughs> Don't move. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. That I I started to realize like what I'd signed up for with the army when I like wandered up onto this like rocky hilltop, and there's just like a really wet <laughs> lieutenant. <laughs> clearly very depressed <laughs> i'm an officer <laughs> this is why we have guests on the podcast because otherwise we just ramble for an hour man we'll see so should we should we introduce what we're talking about that might be good well we're doing wait do you want to do an introduction like we normally do and then just get it to us rambling or do you want to now reintroduce what we're doing well we, it's just us so we don't have to record a separate intro we can just say what <laughs> I was we're talking assuming about. we would have a separate <laughs> intro. <laughs> why do we need to record a separate intro i don't know we're just Dude. talking to each other <laughs> well then in that case hello everyone uh today we're doing faqs frequently asked questions yep lots of dms lots of dms on the page lots of comments on the posts some of them require lengthier answers than i am likely to type out in the dms so uh, we're going to talk about them. Is this the first FAQ we've done or did we, I don't even remember if we put the old one. Uh, a long time ago, back when we were beginner podcasters before we became seasoned veterans. of Free microphones. Yeah, that we, uh, we recorded an FAQ episode. We never published it, but, and it was, it was a little bit sad because like one of the questions centered around training for leg tucks. Oh, that's right. Um, we even did an intro to that episode. Yeah, we did an intro explaining that we recorded it before they got rid of the leg tuck, but now it's like months removed and like, whoops. Yeah, none of it even makes sense anymore. So that one is in the trash can. Sorry, guys. All right. So we have a list of FAQs. We're going to work through them. And some are going to probably require more nuance and discussion than others. But I think one of the takeaways here for the good listeners is that if you do have questions, our goal with these episodes, cause we'll do more of these is to try to come up with a, an Avenue through which they can be answered. So if you do have questions about training, about tactical stuff, about anything related to the things that we talk about on the, on the uh, podcast, shoot them in, slide into Alex's DMS on the Instagram. And you may find that they surface in one of these frequently asked question episodes. Uh, so with, with that, Alex, I'll lead off with the first one here, which is, and I don't know if you have a specific program in mind, but the question at hand is, is insert program good? And what I'm assuming this means is like, is starting strength good? Is 531 good? Is whatever XYZ military athlete good? Uh, go. Yeah, I get, I get various versions of this. People find a program online or they're like halfway through doing a program and they want to know what my thoughts on that program are. Uh, and this, this will blur into the second question, but I, I struggle to answer this one in a coherent way, especially, I mean, considering that I, I don't 
frankly know the people who are DMing me. I don't know the current state of their fitness. I don't know their goals. I don't know what they have access to. I don't know what they like. I don't know what they don't like. I don't know their strengths. I don't know their weaknesses. I don't have like any of the information necessary to figure out like what kind of training would be appropriate for that person. And, and frankly, like if, if the choice is between like pure chaos and a halfway decent program, the program's probably going to work. I mean, if there, if the choice is between almost anything and then like just having consistency and like doing something, yeah, it's, it's probably going to help you out. Um, and this, everybody goes through, like if many of us have gone on some of these programs, some of the well-known programs, lots of people have spent time on 531. There's a whole separate conversation about uh, the horseman program that we'll get to in a second. Love the horseman program. But, but a lot of those like mainstream programs, like starting strength kind of stuff and all that, lots of people who have spent time doing five by five, all these things. And, and most people will probably find that they worked for them because it's just a decent program with some like logical kind of progression in it and some logical kind of volume versus intensity adjustments and things like that. It's, they're, they're probably fine, but I have no ability with some like random DMs to tell you like, okay, yeah, this program's going to be amazing for you or no, that's not the right program for you. Here's the one you should pick. It's just, there's, there's a lot of stuff out there. It's very similar. It's kind of generic by nature, but if you're like at the point in your fitness journey where like you don't necessarily have someone to coach you, you don't necessarily have like these kind of resources at your unit or something and you just want to get on some kind of program. Yeah. Like in general, they're probably going to be a decent starting point and a decent template. Yeah. I'm trying to collect my thought. I mean, like there's, there's the, there's, well, not even the easy answer. There's the correct answer, which is, it depends which you sort of just touched on. Um, but I'm trying to put myself into the shoes of somebody who's reaching out to say is, you know, this thing that I downloaded or paid for or got from a friend, Good. Um, some questions I would kind of ask myself are, does it have any mechanism to account for change? And what I mean by that is, have you been handed, you know, a six month buds prep thing? Cause like stuff like that exists, but you'll find that it's very rigid and does not allow for any fluctuation whatsoever. And what I've seen happen with guys that go down that route is if they start to fall off because of one reason or another, it can create a lot of, a lot of stress around training in general that can lead to some pretty negative consequences. So there's like that piece to be aware of. And there are some, there are some templated programs out there that do have mechanisms for what we'll call auto-regulation. Um, and we can get into some of those as, as part of the next question, but that's kind of step one. And then step two, in terms of my checklist of whether or not some pre program thing is good is like, does it get me excited? And if I, if I do it for a week, cause generally that first day that you're starting a new program is like the most exciting thing ever. And anything is going to be good, but by week two, week three, week four, if from looking at what you have in front of you, you know, that template, if it's looking like you're going to lose interest because there's not enough variety for you or some of the movements that you like to do and training aren't included, like you'll know for yourself if, if, you're kind of checking those boxes. Um, that's how I would define good. It's hard to, I think to your point, it's hard to define good as in like, is this program going to get me the results I'm after? Cause that's person dependent. But how I would define good is, is this program going to scratch the itch that I have that led me to search for programming in the first place? Because the other piece to this is if it is a solid program, you should take some stuff away from that outside of just numbers on the bar or numbers on the, the, you know, watch or whatever, you should take away some lessons and some building blocks that you can add to your repertoire so that when you do decide to sit down and maybe write your own programming, you can pull from a bunch of other stuff and kind of start somewhere. Like for me as a strength coach early on, I actually would buy and collect a lot of programs and see what they were doing, see where the coach's head was at, see what kind of progressions they were running, see how they were incorpor incorporating different things and then from that, I was able to kind of go my own way. And I think that's kind of another way how I would define good. If that makes any sense at all. I like a lot. 
I like what you said about like learning, like whatever program you do, I hope you're learning from it. I like that a lot just in terms of, I think, I think people would be surprised at how many people that are really fit are training mostly intuitively. Um, Alex is a good example. He's, he's a great example, but he's far from the only one there's sure. like, I've, I've consistently been shocked by the number of people I've ended up working with or exposed to or talked to who kind of seems to like graduate into a stage where they kind of can, can decide what their needs are. They know enough about enough different protocols that they can kind of be like, man, I haven't done enough of whatever component of fitness it is. And I know that based on like where I am and what I feel like doing, this is how I'm going to get after that component of fitness today. And that, that seems crazy because everybody wants to have like a beautifully periodized macro cycle for the next two years or whatever it is. Um, but you, you don't get there until you've been through the stages of like being coached and sticking with programs for a few months to really see what that can look like and like experience the the potential progression that you could achieve if you focus on one thing consistently for a while uh, there's there's a lot out there that like regardless of the specific program itself that you will learn just by going through the process well and i think that leads to question number two because what i'm in i mean like again, people that are, that are asking this question are looking for a specific answer, which is what I would imagine they're looking for a yes or no. And so question number two that we have in front of us is what programs or which programs do you recommend? And then what I'll add to that, it's not on here, but what I'll add is, is why. And for me, so I'll, I'll kick this off kind of, again, coming from the strength coach perspective and for myself specifically. So to lay this out, my goals, I've been, I've been in the tactical space my whole career as a strength coach. So I have always gravitated towards training myself in the same fashion. So growing up in CrossFit, doing Jim Jones, doing Seal Fit, doing the Horseman program that we keep alluding to that we'll talk about, like that has informed my biases and it's how I prefer to train for myself. And then now down the road, adding in things like triathlon, you know, I, I like cycling, I like swimming, I like running, but I like lifting as well. So when I think about what program I would recommend to somebody, I gravitate towards some of some of the big names in the industry that people might be familiar with. Like, I think Barbell Medicine has some really solid programs. And one of the reasons I say that is because if you go on a website and, and buy a program and all you receive is an Excel spreadsheet, I think that you're missing the mark. And one thing that Barbell Medicine does well, and they're not the only ones, other companies do this too. When you purchase a program, you also get an ebook. Well, they'll call it an ebook, but really it's, it's just a PDF that has several pages going into depth, explaining the why behind the program. And I think that's incredibly useful. There's been some that I've purchased just for the the description, not for the program itself, because I already have in my brain kind of what I want my own training to look like. I just have a couple of questions about the logistics or the mechanism behind the progressions and things like that. And so I'll read some of the stuff that they've written and use that to inform my decision-making. So I think the Barbell Medicine guys have great, have great stuff. If you're looking for more of a strength bias, if you're looking for more of the endurance type thing, 80-20 running is a great place to start it's a book, it's a website, and I'm 99.9% .9 sure you can buy training plans from that website. That's 8020 running. That to me has always been the answer to the question I get a lot when people are coaches really are getting into the endurance space, which is like, what is the starting strength of endurance? I think starting strength is sort of one of those cookie cutter <clears throat> strength books where people are just looking for the basics and the equivalent of that in the endurance space would probably be something like 80, 20. So if you're looking at trying to inject some endurance into your, into your week, say you're a strength athlete that knows that they need to run for, you know, a PT test or whatever, that's a good direction to go in. I'll let you take over now as I think about more. So I don't just keep rambling. Well, I was going to start by like, not necessarily by name promoting any particular. Oh, I'm program, promoting everyone. Like, I mean, I was going to wait till these people are starting to pay us, but man, they will now, they will now. Cause we're saying their names. I hope so. Call us guys. They will. <laughs> so 
this is going to sound a little bit like similar to my answer for number one. So first I want to say we've, we've alluded to the horseman's thing enough and we should just like kind of answer what the heck we're talking about. Cause some people might not have heard of it. Um, and Drew, you can agree or disagree, but I'm frankly not going to recommend the horseman program. I think it's, <laughs> I think it's like a phase people have to go through. And for whatever reason, I think it's a phase that like every infantry lieutenant in the army goes through. Um, and I, I was not an infantry lieutenant but I was in an infantry battalion. So I PT'd with those guys a lot. Um, so I too went through the phase of doing the horseman program and it's just an obnoxiously stupid amount of volume. Um, we had to, we had to like get to PT at like five 30 and like take over space in the gym before anyone else got there. So we could just do the stupid amount of work we had to do for like two hours. Like the, the warmups on that program are like probably sufficient to hit minimum effective dose for most people. I think Fran is one of the warmups. Probably. <laughs> and that, that's not necessary for like basically anyone. There's probably some freaks out there who would, who it'd be just right for, but like everybody well, let me, else. Hold on. I'll interrupt because there might be people scratching their heads. So rewind for, I'll, I'll take you on my personal journey because <laughs> I think that will elude or that will elucidate what this horseman program is. So like think sort of middle, middle of, of war on terror. So kind of 2008 to 12 ish time frame. you're seeing a lot of these online companies pop up that are selling training. And a lot of it is coming like th that, that to me is sort of the beginning of the tactical strength conditioning space. And you're at least in the commercial sector. So at that time I was in college and I was pretty well set on this kind of tactical human performance idea. And so obviously like some big time buzzwords, military athletes, seal fit, like this stuff was spinning off of CrossFit and you would see dudes like, I mean, I remember a friend of mine and I, we ran the stadium at Chapel Hill in weight vests with gas masks on thinking that we were like <laughs> the most tactical dudes ever. Cause that's the type of stuff that was being put out on like seal fit and seal grinder and so it, it, when you started to spend time on any of the forums, you would see this like horseman program, you know, kind of mysteriously be mentioned and like, who wrote it? What is it? Where is it? And I don't remember how I got my hand. I mean, it, you know, you can find it pretty easily now, but I'm, I'm sure you can. But in, in the days when I found it, it was a very mysterious PDF that like, yeah, your, your buddy's, your buddy's friend from soft found it and right. sent it to him. So and it it's always cool. like, Oh dude, my buddy knows a guy that used this <laughs> to train. And like, this guy is an absolute killer. Like I can't tell you what he does, but anyway, so what it is, what the horseman program is, is they being the guys that created it, who for all intents and purposes are just a bunch of dudes that <laughs> like, like to work out. It's like a mashup of CrossFit, seal fit, Jim Jones. You'll see a lot of the named workouts that people that are familiar with that kind of time, that timeline know about and it literally was like just each day had a theme and you kind of just pick from the hat and it was a roulette wheel of just getting the shit kicked out of you wrapped up in this lens of like tactical and beards and glasses and like just chaos i would not recommend that program but it is fun to look at and it's cool to like you can take some inspiration from it's it. It's a piece of tactical strength and conditioning history. It, I would, I would agree. I think that's a great way to put it. It's a piece of history. I wouldn't necessarily use it. Like it, civil war rifles are cool. I wouldn't necessarily use them to do anything, <laughs> but it'd be nice to get your hands on one just to have it. So yeah, we spiraled out of control with that. <laughs> yeah, we got, we got way off track. I'm going to come back and I'm going to say, first off, it's worth noting that there's a lot of pretty good free content out there in terms of like programming templates that you can use. Uh, so if you, if you feel the need to buy something, you're probably going to get a more polished product. Um, but you can, you can find a lot of stuff and you might have to like make your own spreadsheet with the calculations, or you can like probably find some nerd on Reddit who made it for you and you can download it, whatever. Um, but there, there are versions of 531 floating around for free and there are versions of 5x5 five five floating around for free. And as long as you're like pretty reasonable with like what max you put in there to calculate your working weights and stuff, you're probably going to have a pretty decent time. Um, and there's a million different couch to 5K programs and those will frankly work real well for improving two mile times if that's what you're concerned with. Um, so I think there's there's a pretty good abundance of free, decent resources. You're just going to find that they tend to be boring 
uh, which is which is not necessarily bad. Or you're going to have to learn something because they don't force feed you all the accessories. You have to like pick your accessories from a menu or like pick them based on movement patterns it's telling you to do or things like that. Uh, but that kind of comes back to what you said, Drew, about hopefully whatever program you pick, you kind of learn some stuff about both program design and yourself and your own kind of training desires and stuff in the process. So I, I'm going to be fairly agnostic here and not necessarily recommend certain programs or certain outlets or anything. And just say, like, if you, if you are in the phase where you don't feel like pursuing actual coaching, I think there's sufficient, decent, rational, free programs out there. Um, coming from like reputable sources, just don't go down the rabbit hole of things like horsemen where you're destroying yourself for no reason. I'll, I'll add as a caveat to this one thing I would not recommend. And I think we touched on this with Alec with the concurrent stuff. I would not recommend taking 100% of a strength program and 100% of a running program and putting those together. I think that's where a lot of guys that go down this route of looking for their own training and kind of DIYing their own training based off of templates that they find end up doing that, whether they realize it or not. And that's where you run into a lot of issues. So again, back to what we keep talking about of like the educational piece. If you do take, for example, a five, three, one or a five by five, or, you know, insert whatever strength program here. And then your next you know, the next website you pull up is an endurance program. And you think that slapping those two things together is going to create any semblance of success. I think you'll find pretty quickly after, you know, two or three weeks that you're going to be in a bad place. So I would not recommend that. And I, that's a harder answer to give because there aren't as many straight up hybrid programs out there that you can buy, because in order to do that type of thing effectively, you need a little bit of nuance and, and kind of one-on-one. -on -one. But having said that, from what I've seen, the kind of hybrid space has become much more popular, even within like the last year or two. So much so that if you if you spend a little bit of time digging in sort of the podcast realm and even online, you'll find enough content, I think, that would educate you and allow you to effectively take the strength, the strength approach that you like and the endurance approach that you like and, and put those together in such a way that you'll probably head in the right direction. I'll also take the chance to shout out like it's it's hard to overstate like the the potential benefit from just actually getting coached a little bit like actually having somebody who can assess you and like not just like a PT test assess you but like help understand like what you like and what you really dislike and like what movements you're comfortable with and what movements you're uncomfortable with and I show you the potential you have that you might not realize and all of these things. Um, like the, the general answer here is it's really, really hard to like tell somebody what program is appropriate for them without knowing anything about them. And you might, I mean, even if you don't get coached long-term, just getting like an initial exposure to real coaching might equip you with the tools to be a much more autonomous athlete in terms of taking care of yourself. So yeah, I'd encourage it. I coach people. Send me an email. <laughs> oh, what well, i'll let you ask the next one i asked the first two yeah and this is a frequent one i get and it sometimes it comes from units sometimes it comes from individuals things like that but like hey like you run a fitness page aimed at tactical stuff and particularly at army stuff uh, why don't you just post pt schedules that we can go use and like as a caveat i i have there's like a particular guest post with Brad Godbold that some of you guys have found very useful that is not necessarily a PT schedule. It's just kind of a framework within which to build a PT schedule. So that you like have people rotating through maximizing equipment and things like that. And that's probably as far as I would be comfortable going in terms of like prescriptive stuff for units. And it, it comes back to things we've been discussing a lot recently, but I can't like blindly say this is what the right PT schedule looks like because I don't know what kind of unit it is because I wouldn't want a light infantry unit training the same way as an artillery unit trained, training the same way as an MI unit trains, training the same way as whatever. Like they have, they have different physical demands. They have different operational tempos. They have all sorts of things going on that mean that regardless of even the physical fitness level of the individuals in that organization, 
the goals are so different that I wouldn't necessarily train them the same way. And obviously I don't know anything about the individuals. And like, there's, there's so many like external factors. Like if you're doing a ton of field training that has you on your feet all the time, that changes the amount I would program in like foot time type of conditioning training. And there's just, there's a million different reasons. I don't know what you have access to. Some units have total access to gyms. Some have no access to gyms and it would be pretty obnoxious for me to put out a program that assumes you have a certain degree of equipment, all sorts of things. Um, so I, I, I'll share some kind of frameworky kind of stuff that gives you a starting point, but I do think there is inherent value in the planning process, like of a, of a unit actually going through like a self-assessment of where we are and what our goals are, like doing that real needs analysis and like designing a program that's realistic for them in their situation. And, and I have had people send in like, Hey, this is the program we're doing. Do you think it's decent? And I, I can, I can provide some brief feedback. I'm not necessarily going to like deep dive it because I get a lot of these kinds of messages and I can't go through all of them really detailed, but that's something I, that gives me a starting point to like, see what you're thinking about and what you're trying. And, and we can have a, a better conversation based on something like that than we can based on just like, Hey, it's me, Steve, what should we do? Like, <laughs> I, I don't know what to do with that. Cause there's oh, just so many considerations. I don't know. <laughs> Well, and we've taught, we won't get too far into this because we're going to save this conversation for another episode, but we've, I mean, Alex and I have talked about some different things that I think we might be able to offer folks and kind of where Mops and Moses is headed and what the podcast has done in terms of driving the conversation around tactical human performance. So I think your answer was very sound, but I would also just say like for the folks, like there is probably a world where frameworks can be provided discussions can be had around what right looks like and hopefully folks that might not necessarily know a ton about building their own program or are, are really just getting started we'd like to be able to provide resources for those types of people so i'll, I'll mention that we we won't get ahead of ourselves we're we're getting close to to 20 episodes here which is crazy because it doesn't feel like it's been that long and i remember like a few weeks ago we had no idea how to make a podcast we still probably don't have we still don't know how to make a podcast we're, we're making it up that's true <laughs> but there there is there are types of content that we would love to produce some like more in-depth educational kind of material some like programming template kind of material um, various things but but those take time to produce and uh, frankly, the sticker money is not paying the bills, <laughs> especially when I don't process sticker orders for months at a time because it's really annoying to stuff envelopes with stickers. Shameless plug, buy some stickers. Hey, if you want to, if you want to keep me like under a roof and clothes and stuff, stickers really it's help. The Banksy, it's the Banksy of the tactical sticker space. Is the people don't people stuff. don't realize how much I'm balling out on the sticker money, man. It's, <laughs> <laughs> but like where, where I'm going with that is that like. I, you guys, this is like behind the scenes, social media stuff. The more content you produce, the more engagement you get. And I don't produce that much content. Uh, I was just listening to something with Kelly Sturette, who a lot of you guys are probably aware of. And he mentioned that he produces consistently a thousand unique pieces of content a year. So you're talking about like, like three unique pieces of content per day. Uh, in, in a good week, I produce maybe two pieces of content because um, I like have a job and it's not promoting this. And this is frankly just kind of a hobby right now. Um, and if it, if it does transform into something more than that, it, it may not all be just like free Instagram posts. We'll see. I think that answered how, yeah. So that's the why, I mean, it's, it's not to say that there's a never, but it's just like the, the direct answer is it's hard to assess someone's needs based solely on, direct messages and no context. Of and, and it would feel irresponsible to like point people towards something without more context. I would not feel good about it. Which I think leads nicely into the next question, which is how can I do this, this stuff, this stuff being training without a staff? Yeah. Um, we talk a lot because a lot of the audience for this podcast is like the human performance staff in various tactical environments, but we know full well, that regardless of what tactical community you're a member of, there are a lot of tactical professionals out there who do not have access to strength and conditioning coaches and physical therapists and dietitians and athletic trainers and whatever it is. Um, and 
I think if you're, I mean, if you're following the page and you're listening to this podcast, you clearly have an above average level of interest in human performance kind of stuff and in health and fitness kind of stuff. And I think step one, and this, this slightly gets into how I'll answer one of the questions we're going to get to in a few minutes, but step one is be your own guinea pig and test out some of this stuff and see if it works and like find the value in it and prove that it's useful. And if, if you can prove that it's useful, people will recognize that what you're doing is working. And that's when you get to start having conversations about like, Hey, I know this works. I want to start making a change in this organization. This is what I recommend. This is why. And that, that's, that's how you do it. You start with you. Like not to, I mean, we're, we're get we get army specific plenty, but like we've, we've published some doctrine on the thing. And if you don't like the doctrine, there's a million free resources out there. Go learn a little bit, find what you can apply in your environment and, and start making it a tiny bit better. Teach some classes, make some suggestions, get some guys together and figure out how you can improve planning. Honestly, a huge piece of it is just the planning. Um, I think, I think tactical human performance at its foundation is teaching leaders in tactical professions how to plan better to account for the the needs of the humans in their organizations. How do you plan in a way that creates better opportunities for consistent quality and quantity of sleep? How do you plan better in terms of making sure guys have the opportunity to eat healthier, better food, whatever it is. And and you can start planning better now. You might not be able to do as much as you could if you had like dedicated human performance professionals with you every day, but you can certainly identify where you're falling short and, and start to fix some of it. I will add to this from personal experience and for context, what I mean by that is army specific, conventional army specific at an installation where there are a lot of embedded human performance teams, but not everyone has them. And what I have seen from go-getters from organizations that do not have embedded human performance teams is that they will go out of their way to reach out to folks that they know are on their installation and just ask questions. So like to get specific with it, my brigade does an H2F trainer course that was initially designed for our soldiers, but now has kind of opened up to allow for folks that are not necessarily assigned to our brigade to come and sort of shadow and learn and, and that kind of thing. And we've had a number of folks come by and, and go through that course and then walk away with enough of a, of a baseline knowledge to kind of DIY their own, you know, human performance program for their organization. And it's going to look different for everybody. Some, some groups have discretionary funds and they can buy training software that has programming available and they can kind of push that out to a lot of people. And then others are just kind of piecing together, you know, they might've carved out some space in a warehouse and dudes are just bringing gym equipment from home. And like, I've seen all of those work successfully. It just, I think to your point hinges on the motivation of people at whatever level deciding to own that conversation. Cause I, I mean, I've even seen it play out where like people at the lower end of the totem pole can like make organizational shifts because they decided to take action and leadership just by virtue of not necessarily having enough time to do it themselves sees that catch on and then supports it, throws resources, throws time, you know, whatever added, and it kind of takes off. So I guess the takeaway there is that the idea of embedded human performance in tactical settings is broad enough now. And I say this as somebody who's part of that. If, if anybody does not have access to these types of things, reach out and ask, because from what I've seen, I have yet to come across a practitioner who is not more than happy to help somebody that comes and just asks the question. Like, and actually I'll go so far as to say, if you go up to a strength coach or a PT or an AT or whomever and ask for help and they tell you to go away, like reach out to me and I'll reach out to them and tell them that they're being an asshole because I have never run into somebody like that in this profession, specifically to tactical, but I would imagine collegiate and et cetera, the same way, but it, it it's, never going to hurt to just ask for help. Hey, can I, can I shadow a PT session? Can I kind of show you one of the programs I put together for myself and get your feedback? Hey, you know, I've got my unit has this, this, and this in terms of equipment. W what can we do like that type of stuff? Those questions will never go unanswered by somebody who cares. And I'll leave it at that. Cause I'm getting, I'm getting esoteric. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to go a slightly different direction. And I, I find myself referencing 
Nate, if you're listening, I reference our conversations like every third episode or something. I hope Nate listens. Hello, Nate. But I, uh, I've been talking to him recently about this idea of like, how do we decide who gets the resources? And there's, there's an idea that the resources should go to those who are like in the worst situation right now. Right. But, but there's a built-in trap to that a little bit, I think. And I'll, I'll say this for like all the people asking for these resources or like frustrated that they don't have the resources yet. If you are doing nothing to make your situation better with what you already have, why do you deserve these resources? And I think that's something that like people have to really deal with, right? Cause like if, if an organization and if it's leaders and if it's people are not trying to maximize the things they already have access to and do better in the situation they are already in, no amount of resources will make that situation better. It doesn't matter how many people we hire or how many facilities we build or how much equipment we provide. If you're not to some degree a self-starter in trying to solve these problems, it, the resources will not help. I'm sorry. Because at the end of the day, like human performance professionals added to the organization do not change the culture. Leaders change the culture. Leaders within the organization change the culture. And in tactical professions, it's leaders in uniform that change the culture. And that's, that's unavoidable. So it's, it's less of a, like, how can I do this without a staff? And it's more, you probably already know what you should be doing and you need to just start working on it. Like you can see the problems and yes, it might be hard to convince people to make changes. We get that but you can, you can go out of your way to learn a little bit. You can go out of your way to make some proposals wherever you are. And like, I, I get DMS from like the most junior people to include people who have like not yet gone to basic training and are just trying to figure out how to get ready for basic all the way up to like, and this is really cool for me, honestly, but like routinely getting messages from like current and former battalion commanders and stuff who are like trying to implement this stuff from that level. And that's really, really cool. Um, but I think all of those people, regardless of how low or high you are on the totem pole, have the capacity to make a positive impact now without any additional resources. And that will just set you up for more success when and if you do eventually have some of these resources. That was preachy. Sorry. No, I think we'll put a bow on it. Um, okay. Next one. How can I pursue working in this field after serving this field being human performance. I'll take this. Well, I'll start this. Um, strength and conditioning, well, not even strength and conditioning specific. Um, the field of human performance in the tactical space is kind of divided into three. Well, from my perspective, you may add to this, but there's sort of three channels. There's the active duty component. Some staff members and some, some career fields are active duty specific. Um, there's the civilian piece, so your, your GS civilians, and then there's your contractor piece. Most of the positions that I think this question would be alluding to, kind of the strength and conditioning type stuff, most of that is through contracting. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with what that means, basically the government says, hey, we need, you know, 100 strength coaches. And then companies who can supply those people will bid on that contract and they will say, hey, we can do that for this dollar value. And they'll compete against other companies that say they can do that for that dollar value, et cetera. Someone gets awarded the contract and then that company hires folks. So I'm kind of going through the admin side and then we'll get to sort of the practical side of like what tests and certifications and things like that. So if you're sitting there kind of getting close to getting out, or I'll even add to this, for folks that might be listening that aren't in the military, but want to get into the, the tactical human performance space, the NSCA job board, indeed.com, um, those types of resources are where you will find the majority of these postings. LinkedIn is also a good resource for that. Facebook, if you get into some of the NSCA kind of tactical spaces, they'll post a lot of the jobs. It tends to Actually, it doesn't even really tend to ebb and flow anymore. I think with H2F, there's a pretty constant and steady stream of opportunities that are available. Um, and Alex, you probably know this better than I do in terms of the minimum requirements they're looking for. But for the most part, it's going to be three to five years of experience in the space. Some are lower, some are higher, depending on if you're getting into special operations or conventional or whatever. Um, you know, having your CSCS, the TSAC, the, tact the NSCA tactical certification is becoming more prevalent. Um, that type of stuff is kind of your bare minimum. And then anything above that 
will just sort of help your case. I'll let you jump in as I think about some more things. Yeah, I just want to add a few for clarification, like common misconceptions I've seen. Um, the just this is clarification for people in general, whether you're military or like trying to get into the field or whatever. But the the tactical strength and conditioning certification, the TSAC, is not designed for full time professionals in the field originally. Uh, it was designed for full time tactical professionals who have like additional responsibilities for fitness. Um, and I think it's pretty good for that, but nobody gets hired, frankly, based on that certification alone. Um, it's a, it's a decent, like additional thing to have if you're going to continue to serve in uniform, um, because it gives you a little bit extra knowledge that you can use to train your formation a little bit better. Cool. Um, but if you're trying to do this thing full time, it's very much an add on. Um, it is not like a standalone one that you're going to get jobs based on necessarily. Um, additionally, I have not yet seen, and this is, there's probably a, a carve out here for like MWR facilities, but if you're trying to work in one of these like true quote unquote human performance programs for like any organization in the DOD, police, fire, whatever, uh, as far as I can tell, basically all of those require certified strength and conditioning specialist which is your CSCS. And that requires you to have a college degree to sit for that test. Um, so just understand that that is like, that's how you get your foot in the door is that certification in almost every setting I've seen. Um, just to be clear, because like a lot of people run around trying to get their TSAC and like, how do I get a job based on that? You don't really, you gotta, you, you gotta go. Yeah, you don't. Your CSCS. <laughs> um, and the other, but, I'll, the other thing I'll add to this is, and I experienced this as someone who's now on the hiring side of things. Like there is not as much freedom of maneuver for hiring people as you might think. So like, if you were to go to like, I don't know why a bank is coming to mind, but like any, any company that you want to work at, typically if you have a good personality, you get along with the person you're talking to and you, you meet the requirements, like you're good to go. In this world, because of the way contracting specifically works, if you don't meet to the letter, the requirements on the contract, they will make no exception because that is what is being required of them by the government. So like I get hit up a lot by people on LinkedIn asking how they get into this space. And most of them are like good dudes and good people. But until you meet to the letter, what is on that job description, they won't hire you, even if they want to because that's what they're beholden to on the government. And I've seen that with, or they will hire you because they're in a hurry and you'll get fired on day one when you right. get to the installation and they find out you don't have the requirements. Yes. And we've seen that happen as well. So just be aware that like it, it I, I say that because if you, if you are coming from sort of, we'll call it the normal hiring space or the civilian world and things are a little bit more nuanced for government work, getting in the door, like it is, there is not much nuance at all. Like it's pretty spelled out. Like you have to be this, this, and this to work this. And if you're not any of those things, very, very rarely, if ever, and really never will they make an exception. And like one thing, I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, but there is a difference between a strength and conditioning coach and it's personal trainer. Um, your, your average personal trainer cert is not going to get you anywhere in most of these conversations, just realistically. Yeah. Unless you have the letters CS, CS. Yeah. And I'll, I'll also add, we, we were very contractor centric in there. Um, if you are going to pursue like an actual federal civilian employee kind yeah, of Yeah. Let's talk civilians. Yeah. And there, there's a lot to talk in that world, but I want to emphasize one thing up front, which is that the federal hiring system is very, very different than, and like you alluded to it, cause it's, it's somewhat similar to the contracting thing, but like you're going to have to learn a lot just to like figure out how to apply properly. Um, you're going to have to learn how USA jobs <laughs> works. You're, you're going to have to generate a federal resume, which looks nothing like a civilian resume. Like you might have the most beautiful single page, well-formatted, awesome civilian resume. It's not going to help. Your federal resume is going to be like six pages long. It's you, if you're doing it right, you probably have to tailor your resume to every position you apply for to make sure it has all of the key words that that particular application is looking for. Because the first thing that's going to happen is that resume is going to go into a fully automated filter and it's going to screen out a lot of people and it's going to screen out a lot of qualified people 
and forward the resumes of some unqualified people just based on how well crafted this federal resume was to like meet the requirements of this automated system. It's super frustrating. It sucks. I know, but like, it's the game you have to play if you want to get into some of the civilian roles. That's just how it is, regardless of whether you're like a medical professional or trying to do some leadership stuff in this space, whatever it is. And I, I will shout out, I know I didn't like shout out organizations I necessarily endorse in the programming thing, but if you, if you are a transitioning service member or a veteran who is trying to get into federal civilian work, there are lots of resources for you. Um, I know there are more than like what I've necessarily tapped into, but I had a really good experience with Hire Heroes USA. They have a, a really awesome federal resume team that you can send them like the civilian resume you already have, and you can send them the job listing you're applying to. And for $0, because they're a nonprofit that helps veterans, they will generate a federal resume tailored to that particular position back to you. And they'll like highlight anywhere they need you to add stuff and, and finish it up before it's done. And that is immensely valuable. I honestly don't know how Drew found his way into civilian work without like assistance with the federal resume <laughs> thing, because it is, I never would have figured it out without help. I'll be honest. So, and I'm glad you brought that point up because for context and background, I, my undergrad degree is in business. So I went to business school and they teach you, well, they teach you their version of resume building and how to apply to job. And that is a very, very different thing uh, to Alex's point. And I don't know why a whole new world from, I think the little mermaid keeps playing in the back of my head because like the USA jobs and federal government hiring is its own world. Um, and I have, I have been on, I have been an applicant into that world. I obviously I work in that world and the position that I am in now, I receive resumes and hire people. So I'm on the other side of it. And that was incredibly eye opening to me because to your point, and just to kind of walk through this, you create the resume, you see the posting online on USA jobs. If you meet the requirements, because that's another piece too, not every job is open to every person. So you know, they're thankfully USA jobs is like, they have pretty cool symbols and you can kind of see like, is this for, you know, civilians, is this for general public? Is this for spout? Like, so get through that wicket first. And if you hear my dog barking in the background, I apologize. Um, assuming you're eligible and assuming that you fill that thing out and you submit your resume, like you said, it gets thrown into a computer that scans your resume for words that match the job posting. So wink, wink, nudge, nudge, copy, paste helps in that scenario. If you get through that wicket, then someone sitting at personnel collects everybody that is referred to the hiring manager. And then that packet gets someone that knows nothing about the field. knows nothing about the field sends those resumes to, in, in my case, to me. So I receive a PDF document that has anywhere from two to 50 resumes. And this is where I would add a caveat to what Alex was talking about, especially for service members, because I have now seen this play out a lot with service members. Take the time to format your resume well, because I'm sitting there and, and there's a lot of people like me. I'm not the only one obviously doing this, but like we as human beings have our own biases, our own preferences, et cetera. If you have three or four different fonts on your resume, I'm not going to look at it. If it's not aligned well, I'm not going to look at it. If you like have some weird cursive something with your name on the top, I'm not going to look at it. If your cover letter and your resume don't work well together, you know, you kind of get the idea. So what I mean by that is take the time to include the human element in that, because when you get to the hiring manager phase, what we as hiring managers are looking for is the human being because you've already gotten through kind of the robotic piece of things. And now I'm making a decision about who I want to work for me. And I want somebody that knows how to type. I want somebody that has good grammar. I want somebody that takes the time because that tells me that they're going to be very professional in their work environment. So those were just kind of some of the lessons learned that were kind of eye opening to me when I was on the hiring end of things, because for the longest time I was just on the applicant side of things. And I don't think people connect two and two together because they think they're just applying to this big, massive thing, which is the U S government. I think we answered the initial question, which is how do I get into this? The short answer is go to college and get a CSCS. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is pretty much the <laughs> short answer. This became like a whole, like, how to apply to federal jobs conversation. Though. Maybe we have a set, maybe we have a separate podcast on that. Who knows? 
Yeah, maybe one day. I think there's, I mean, there's a lot of people out there who are qualified that just don't know how the system works. So, yeah. And it is like at the end of the day, it is a game. Like you, you have to play the game. Um, it's also, yeah, it is a crapshoot. There's, there's a lot of people cruising USA jobs all the time, applying to a lot of things. Um, you will get screened out of jobs that you are qualified for. Yep. You will not get forward to the hiring manager when you should have been. Um, you will get rejected a lot before you get what you want, all that kind of stuff. And when you do, if, if you do get selected, because I'm working through this right now with a position I hired for, it may take a long time before you start. Some of that is down to human error, not my human error, other people that I'm chasing down. But there is a world where you get offered the position and then depending on the level of security, you know, et cetera, it may take a number of months before you're actually going into work. Um, so just keep that in mind too, from the civilian standpoint, contractors less. So usually that's pretty quick turnaround. Um, but for some of the federal positions, it can take some time. That was our longest answer. It was surprisingly, that was kind of like a one-off question. I thought was pretty quick, but well then, okay, we'll circle back to more kind of embedded humor performance specific questions. And, and this is the last one I have on my list, which is how do I convince my leadership to do blank? Uh, and I think for the purposes of this conversation, I'm guessing, and you can correct me, I'm guessing this is how do I convince my leadership to buy into human performance? That's yeah, how I'm thinking and, about it. And for context here, we'll, we'll rewind a couple of years to when I was putting people through the master fitness trainer course, we, we used to get two pieces of feedback really, really consistently in like every single AAR, like reaching back out to graduates, whatever it was. And item number one was, this is the best or one of the best army courses I've ever been to. It's professionally run. It's really good content. It's really enjoyable. It's, it's a good time. Really appreciate it. And that was nice and, you know, warm fuzzies. Thanks guys. Um, and then the second piece of feedback was, but despite that, my leadership won't let me do any of the things you taught me. And, and that's frustrating and hard. And this comes back to a theme we've kind of identified with a few of the recent episodes, which is that the, the quote unquote soft skills matter dramatically more than the technical knowledge. Um, like no one out there, like I promise your company commander and battalion commander are not going to think your ideas are better just because you have a certificate that says master fitness trainer. <laughs> they're they're going to think your ideas are better for, for all the same reasons that they decide to trust anyone. And, and something I harp on a lot is like the Brett Bartholomew stuff from his book, Conscious Coaching. But like, and people have different interpretations of the word and stuff, but like, if you, if you stop calling it buy-in and start calling it trust, it becomes much more clear what you need to do. You need to, you need to earn trust and you need to give trust. Um, if you're, if you're working as a team, you have to present as a team. Um, nobody's going to be interested in like the recommendations of the team. If they seem like they're divided and people disagree with each other and there's all sorts of infighting and stuff, you guys can, if you work as a team, it is totally fine to tear each other to shreds behind closed doors. But once you're out there making recommendations to leadership, you need to present a united front. You need to be consistent. You need to be on the same page. Uh, if you're an individual doing this stuff, the, the first piece of advice I'll offer is going to be frustrating to some. But in this world of like health, fitness, performance stuff, the first step to getting your leadership to trust what you're suggesting is to be much fitter than them. <laughs> that is 100% true. Uh, and that's, that can be a challenge sometimes. And like things are relative, right? You don't have to be better than them at everything, but you probably should be better than them at least a couple things. Um, you, you should be like fit enough and interested in it enough that they take seriously what you're saying. It does not matter what you learned in a classroom if you can't prove it in action. So it's funny because I, I read this question from two lenses. One is the one that you just described, which is kind of, Hey, I'm a soldier, sailor, Marine, whatever. How do I convince my leadership to do this. The other lens now with all these embedded teams is, Hey, I'm a strength coach, you know, AT, how do I get NCOs bought in? How do I get senior NCOs, company commanders? And I think it's, it's the same ultimately. And the term you used buy-in, I, I think you, you kind of have to recognize like buy-in is a marketing term and marketing is an extension of sales. So you have to be able to sell the thing. And that gets to, I think your point about walking the walk and this is more so for strength coaches but even for soldiers like you have to present as though you 
embody what it is you're trying to do. So if I'm standing in front of an NCO or any kind of, you know, mid-level leader who makes decisions for a group of people that I want to have an impact on, if I'm telling them, Hey, fitness is important, this, that, and the other, and I'm 400 pounds, they're probably not going to listen to what I'm saying. Additionally, if they're not buying into what you're selling, and I think Mark talked about this in the episode we have with him, it's probably less so because of what you're selling them and more so because you haven't found the correct angle to really get at what their problem statement is. So everybody in a leadership position has in front of them a series of problems. And if you can provide a solution to one of those problems, then you're probably well on your way to having the type of organizational impact that you want to. So for example, if you're a strength coach or an NCO or whoever that wants to kind of take over PT for your, your group, but you find that there are some pretty stubborn individuals that own that process. The first thing you should probably do is become the biggest proponent of what it is that they're doing. Because once they see you as a peer or somebody that they can kind of throw ideas off of, you've now got your foot in the door to inject change. And it's not like you're conning them, but in a way you are because you're trying to impact their decision-making because at this point in the process, they're still running the show. And I think what you'll find is that over time, as they learn that they can trust you more and more, they will probably offload some of that responsibility, you know, more and more and more because what they start to to peel away from is the ego that they associate with the ownership of that thing in the first place. And I recognize that I'm rambling a little bit, but I think Mark really hit on this when we talked to him about this exact question. And it was basically, if you're not getting somebody to do what it is that you want them to do, maybe you just kind of change the way in which you're trying to do the thing. Um, you know, whether that's a fitness program, whether that's much larger organizational change, what have you, the, the strategy is effectively the same. And, and you said marketing and sales in there and, and people feel weird about marketing and sales. There's a, in like the health and fitness world, there's a ton of like books and products and classes and stuff to like teach performance professionals, how to like feel better about doing sales without feeling grimy. Um, and I, I think it's important because like nothing succeeds without sales, right? Um, for, for example, this podcast, there is a, (laughs) there is a direct correlation. There is a very, very direct correlation between how many downloads this, each individual episode of this podcast gets and how many times per week I put it in my story. We're just great salespeople. It it sounds dumb. It's annoying. It's frustrating. (laughs) Like, but, but like nobody hears about what you're trying to do without sales. So just like learning a little bit of sales tactics might really help you out. Well, and sales does not like, cause I'm with you. And again, back to me being in business school, like sales was sort of the one track that I avoided. Interestingly enough, I did marketing, which is ultimately the same thing, but um, it's not the same thing. If you're in marketing or sales, I know there's a difference, but selling something does not necessarily mean cold calling, knocking on a door, going up to someone's office and saying, Hey, I think you should do, you know, I want to take over PT. You should do this. Like you need to come at it from the why, like what is the pain point you're trying to solve? Is it that running PT or, or having human performance is just an added duty for this individual. And you think that you could kind of take that, that pain away from them, whether they realize it or not. Um, You know, all those types of questions, that's the sales piece of it. So I think to your point, like, People engage in sales a lot more than they probably recognize. And in the human performance space, because we are inundated with so many free resources, good, bad, or otherwise, like you have to show them the why you can't just assume that if you build it, they will come because that will not happen. Yeah. It's I've, I've heard the line of like, if you build it, they will come thing. If you build it right, they'll come. Uh, If, if you build something like ramshackle and random, they're not coming. And they're more likely to show up if you've already got a couple like key people there in the first place. And those are the people you have to sell. Yeah. I think we answered that one. I think so. It's a hard one because like convincing leadership will always come down to like individual personalities and like what the problems that they have in front of them are and like what they have the time to worry about and whether your leadership is interested in working out in the first place and a, a million other things. Um, so we, we can't, there's no like secret trick 
to convincing everyone. Um, but like a, a good step one is just refuse to accept no for an answer and definitely do not accept no as an answer from someone who does not have the authority to give you the yes you need. Uh, it's it's going to take a few tries. It might take some time. You might have to prove it with smaller groups before you can take it to the scale you want it to, whatever it is. Just, just recognize that this takes time uh, and, and start with like leading yourself before you lead others. I think next time we do one of these FAQs, we can just answer them all with it depends and then close out after 30 that'd seconds. Be a, that'd be a whole separate podcast. Like we can create a podcast called It Depends and like bring different callers in and they can ask some like really well-crafted questions and we can just call them It Depends. <laughs> you could have people call in. Oh man. <laughs> well, so those were the six. And like we said at the beginning, um, this is something that we would like to do more of because I think there's a demand for it and there's definitely space for it. So send questions in like whatever they might be. Um, the more we get, the more we'll kind of craft into these types of episodes and then hopefully, hopefully start moving the needle in the right direction. And send some of the questions to Drew because yeah, I get tired of answering me. all these DMs. You can ask, you can harass him too. It's okay. I don't like, I'm on Instagram a lot. I don't like Instagram. You may have seen Alex is obviously much better at it than I am, but I do have an account up there. You're more than welcome to DM me. You're more than welcome to email me. You can call me if you want. It's uh, mostly his kid. It's not a yeah. lot of fitness content. You realize when you like before you have kids, you make fun of people that have kids because all they have are pictures of their kids. Then you have kids and it's all you take pictures of. So I totally empathize with that. But I promised behind all the, the woodworking, the kids, the bread baking, <laughs> strength and conditioning knowledge so feel free to slide into my dms too and we'll throw those into the faqs in the i forgot about the bread baking there might be more bread than pictures of this we can do a bread episode if we want like we can do whatever we want <laughs> i do not understand even a little bit how into bread you get like i don't it all looks like loaves of bread to me i don't understand the difference. God, you're such an listen the people out there that bake their own bread just understand alex doesn't know what he's talking about <laughs> all right we're signing off later